Greetings and salutations, fellow Sky Watchers from all corners of the globe, no matter where you're listening from. Welcome to Sky Watchers Radio. As always, I am one part of the dynamic duel, Angel, and with me as always is Alan. Say hi to the crowd, Alan. Hi, crowd! Now we're broadcasting live from New Logic Entertainment Studios, live on the Dark Matter Radio Network, and of course PSN Radio, and we are joined... From the very beginning of this show, I want to just uh, have them have them on because we have a lot to talk about. We're going to be joined with somebody who I've been getting bombarded with emails asking where he's been, Mr. Alejandro Rojas from Open Minds. Alejandro, welcome to the show, and thank you for joining us during the first hour here, sir. Hello. It is my absolute pleasure to be back, my friend. Let me tell you something. Never has this happened before on any of my radio programming that uh, a person has, cannot be on one week and I literally get bombarded with people asking me, what the heck did you do? Why was he on? <laughs> yep, yep. I was you know, blamed for it. And something really cool was going on last week. I understand you were at some MUFON uh, stuff. Uh, there was a shooting, and I'm not talking about with guns. In, in, <laughs> tell us what happened here with MUFON. There's a, what was this, uh, some kind of a training video exercise? What, what's going on? Oh, yeah, yeah. And this actually made a pretty big story. We haven't even posted our story on it. We posted kind of a smaller story, and it's gotten big. But, uh, yeah, MUFON last week did a boot camp for their for their field investigators. And it was a week long in the Arizona desert to go out there. Part of it was in the classroom. The other part was out in the desert doing some testing and stuff like that. So, yeah, we did. We go, went out there to film. We got some great interviews. Uh, but we were only able to do the classroom part because the other part was just a little too far away for us. And uh, but we got some pictures and Roger Marsh, they sent Roger Marsh some pictures because apparently they had created this silver kind of fake that looks like a giant colander, silver kind of chrome plated colander upside down in the desert. Is that the the colander thing that the guy uh, from Ghostbusters wears on his head? I don't. I'm not familiar with that colander what? thing, but uh, don't, you, don't you remember that uh, Rick Moranis wears the colander around his head, and he's like, "Are you the?" Oh gamer? yeah, that's right. I remember oh. that part. That was pretty funny. But no, it is very different. This would have to be a very big person to wear this one. But I guess they had this thing out there. It was a fake uh-huh. UFO, and according to them. Uh, this plane flew over, and then some F-16 jet fighters flew over, they think, checking it out. But uh, Luke Air Force Base isn't too far away, so they could have been some, doing some training. And they may have checked it out because they thought it was a crashed uh, airplane or something. But uh, make for kind of a cute story that uh, has gotten really big. But uh, we got some really cool interviews with these guys because, for instance – uh, you know, the guy's house it was at, Chuck Modlin, who is kind of in charge of the tech for MUFON, he's got this crazy background of working in defense and working on, on um, like, aircraft carriers and all of this cool stuff. But he gave us some really cool quotes about UFOs and investigating UFOs and the importance of the technology and everything and uh, really cool stuff. So we're excited to post the video. We'll do that in a couple of weeks. We just got the pictures from the guy's. But, uh, yeah, that's what we were up to uh, last Tuesday. Right. See, people, it was something important. Sounds fun. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. So that's what – yeah, you're right. It is something that's fun, I think, because people wouldn't know about it. uh, Right. And so it was great that we were able to get out there and – Tell people about it because we want to do that as much as possible is tell people about all this cool stuff that's going on in this field, you know? Yeah, no kidding. You know, we missed you last week, man. We had Travis on, and oh, my goodness. It was what so a cool. fun show that was, yeah. Yeah, he's awesome. I love having this dude on. I mean, he's uh, one of the the best guests to have on the show, and he's such a nice nice, guys, uh, nice guy to talk to. Uh, really missed you. He says hi, by the way. Yeah, we're really <laughs> excited because on the 5th of November, we're going to go out there to film this uh, yeah. This, uh, you know, Skywatch at the place where that all took place. Where it place. actually and happened, yeah. Yeah, so if we get taken or if he gets taken, you know. Um, <laughs> and you it's know, funny because it... I interviewed him and the last thing I said is we're going to be out there. So if you get taken, we're going to film it. And he had to <laughs> pause. Like he was like, oh, he's like, I wouldn't like that. <laughs> he would not be a happy camper. You yeah. know, he wouldn't, be, he wouldn't be happy with round two. Yeah, you know, he, has he been back in the area much? Because I know he doesn't like going to that area much. He doesn't yeah, go there I, much. Huh? 
I wrote a story about it last week just specifically on right. that uh, aspect. And you're right. He doesn't go back there much. It took him a long time to go back there. He's only been back there once in the night, and that was for a filming for a D- Discovery Channel thing. So it was with a lot of people. Um, so this will be really the second time. Well, it'll be with another group of people, but doing a sky watch. So, so he he gets worried about being out there. He gets kind of freaked Do you out. Blame him. Yeah, why, I know. Why put yourself out there though if, if you're going to be worried about it? I mean, it's kind of like inviting them to come back and take them. Yeah, well, I think. Know, it, I'm uh-huh. sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to say all these TV shows and everybody's probably begging him to take him yeah. out there. And so eventually I think he broke down and, and he's done it. And so it probably made him a little more uh, used to going out there. I think we should have some real fun and actually have yep. him go out there Bigfoot hunting. Just yeah. cross-pollinate. That's it. Just cross-pollinate the whole entire event. Well, I know he's got – there's some guys in Arizona because he's kind of our – little arizona contingency he's because he's out here I, luckily i get to see him we went camping a few weeks ago mm. um and uh there is this group of goat or bigfoot hunters that kind of join us uh sometimes in these excursions so is that bobo with us just a few weeks ago i hope that's not bobo it's not i bobo um bobo it, from the show um yeah, no, it's uh, these other guys. Uh, they they they're specially specialized in the Mogollon Rim and the Mogollon Monster. They call the Bigfoot out in that area. But uh, to be honest, I forget what they call themselves. <laughs> All I could say is a great googly moogly. Yeah. Everybody, you know, in paranormal field, all the groups have their own names and acronyms and stuff. And uh, indubitably. Uh, yeah. Speaking of great guests, tonight, by the way, uh, before we continue with uh, the news here, Alejandro, we're going to have an amazing set of guests after uh, after this segment. Uh, we have Dan Martin who's going to join us at the end of this hour, and uh, we're going to talk about some stuff that he's promoting. Yeah, Dan Martin's a really cool author. He has a book uh, about how to survive the global apocalypse. You know, or Which any kind one? Of the financial, the glo- The financial one, the zombie one, the Ebola one, or the alien one? The one DC Comics is going through after Marvel announced their cinematic Phase 3. Oh, but anyway, good God, yes. You like that dig, huh? All right. Oh, yeah. We're going to talk to Dan uh, about some really cool stuff later, but in this second hour, and i got to mention this, Alejandro, because he actually said to tell you hi. So, And I know he's cool. listening. Hello. We're going to have none other than Mr. Michael Heiser on the show. Should I wait, Let me rephrase that. Dr. Michael Heiser. He didn't go to, to school for a long time to be just called Mr. He's a doctor. Dr. Michael Heiser. And look, people who've listened to Art Bell over the years should not be uh, a stranger to this man at all. Fascinating uh, person. I've been a fan of what he's uh, done for many, many, uh, well, a couple of years now, at least two or three years, maybe four or five, maybe six, a lot longer, because guess what? He was on with Art Bell many years ago. I and, claim uh, him as the master debunker. Let's put it this way. Uh, this man turned me into a Zachariah Sitchin hater. Completely. <laughs> and I used to be and I used to be like the biggest fanboy for Zachariah Sitchin, Planet X, you know, all that stuff. I loved his work and then I saw Michael Heiser completely take him apart and I was like I, I was done. Just, yeah. Just completely. I'm surprised you're brave enough to say that because people don't like to hear bad stuff about Sitchin, but it's, I... a, it's true. It's true. And it's, you know, in the, especially in the ufology community, he's very, very highly regarded and people love his work. And uh, like Eric Van Daniken and, and the ancient alien stuff, look, uh, I believe that we've been visited, Alejandro. I believe mm-hmm. aliens have come down. I believe uh, that there is alien life out there. And there's a story we're going to get to in a little bit, but with. Uh, Brian Cox, a scientist who completely is dumbfounding me with a statement. And then there's a clarification on the statement that Alejandro is going to talk about also. But uh, before we get into that, you know, it dumbfounds me whenever I hear anybody say that there is no existence of life out there. No, I believe that there's life out there. Uh, but, you know, I also believe that people lie. Mm-hmm. And I love what Michael Heiser has done, uh, what Chris White did with his uh, video, uh, Ancient Aliens Debunked, completely just put it out there. You know, look... Whether you believe this stuff or not, go and do your own homework. That's what I did. I, I saw the videos, and I went, and I started doing a little of my own research, and Michael Heiser was on point, I mean, on everything. Well, everything's true on the Internet if you look hard enough. <laughs> that is true, too, but see, I did, my, I did a little bit of old school research. I didn't just look sure up Wikipedia. Sure you did. I yep, didn't just look up Wikipedia. Yeah, Wikipedia. That's what I did. 
probably. But guess what? We're also joined uh, with by Eugene, who's joining us on the uh, call here. And Eugene is sitting back, and I know he's uh, uh, eager to talk to Michael Heiser also. Isn't that right, Eugene? Oh, I cannot wait. I was screaming right then when I was muted, too, about the Planet <laughs> X stuff. But I know you're I, a big, I'm, I'm not you're a big pal- Yo, but I, you're a Planet X uh, fan, aren't you? I, I am, but it's not so much as Sitchin. I mean, more Bob Fletcher lately has really gotten me back into it. I mean, I, I don't know if any of you have heard his uh, Late Night in the Midlands or Coast to Coast interviews in the past month or so, but I don't know. He completely turned me back around. Like I said, I'm not too much into Sitchin, but this I, I don't I'm waiting to see what Heiser says before I make up my mind. Completely. Well, I'll put it. I'll put it this way. This is one of the things that really got me interested in researching what Heiser was talking about years ago when he was on Art Bell and and when he literally publicly challenged Zechariah to debate him. And Zechariah knew about this challenge and he never ever accepted it. Yeah, I mean, I I can't defend Sitchin. I mean, I'm a I'm not in any position to, but I mean, there's there's no points I can throw out to win the debate, especially with somebody like Heiser. So, I mean, as far as he goes, Heiser's going to win that debate every time. But as far as no the what I take issue with with Heiser is is he he makes comments like that every UFO sighting can be boiled down to either technology we have or the breakaway civilizations that Dolan talks about what tech they have. So it's it's a little murky for me. Well, yeah, but we, we just don't know. That's the whole point. We don't know yeah, what the I mean, answers are. Not knowing doesn't it's mean... It's all it. speculation right now. Right. And even I think even Mr. Uh, or Dr. Heiser would agree that it's really all speculation. It's all theories because nothing can be really proven. Uh, but moving on, we're going to have him on in the second hour. He's the main event for the for tonight. And I'm so excited to have him on. I've been uh, This is literally a show a couple of years in the making, guys, because I'm a big, big fan of, of what he's done. And this is a rarity, by the way. And Alejandro, you're going to laugh. Uh, this is a rarity because, as you know, Dr. Heiser, he's a religious man. He's a b- biblical scholar. Uh, I'm an atheist. So, and this is a first, I think this is one of the first times on radio where you're going to have an atheist and a, a biblical scholar who agree almost 100% on something. Crazy, huh? Entertaining is more like it. Just a little Wild money. stuff. But moving on with uh, more news, Alejandro, uh, what's going on with Open Minds? I know there's... Uh, uh, Area 51 uh, deathbed confession uh, by a gentleman by the name of Boyd Bushman. Can we talk about him for a minute? Because this caught my attention. And uh, this is an interesting uh, story. And I've always said that the deathbed confessions would be a great way for disclosure to happen because these guys have nothing really to, to hide anymore. They're dying. Mm-hmm. Uh, but this this one's a little hokey, isn't it? I mean, there's holes being poked on this one already. Well, in Yes, in many ways uh, there are holes, and I've been following this story for a long time, and in fact, we kind of have a a bit of an exclusive in our story that we posted on this today, in that Boyd Bushman was really an engineer. Uh, He was a senior scientist for Lockheed Martin. Many years ago, I first saw him on a documentary in 1999 called The Billion Dollar Secret that Nick Cook, a guy who writes for Jane's Defense, the famous defense magazine, uh, did for Discovery Channel, and he interviewed a bunch of people looking into black projects. He also then, towards the end, wanted to talk about anti-gravity, and he said pretty much all the companies said they're not working on anti-gravity, but he got an interview with one senior scientist for Lockheed who would talk about it, and that was Boyd Bushman. Right. Boyd Bushman was really vague. You know, He mm-hmm. was making these weird statements, and Nick Cook was like, I feel like he wants to tell me something because Nick Cook is English, and that's supposed to be an Great accent, accent yes. I'm doing right yeah. there. Yeah. I feel he wants <laughs> to tell me something, but, but he can't. So uh, then Boyd Bushman started getting into his ideas about how he, Lockheed isn't doing that research, but he is, and he thinks it's, there's something to it, and he believes in the Hutchinson effect, which is this scientist in Canada who does kind of these sound waves uh, that he frequencies, that he sends it stuff, and it supposedly makes things levitate. So they talked about that. Interesting enough. Okay. So then in 2007, he's on uh, From Here to Andromeda, which is kind of a, a documentary. I call it kind of a, obscure because have you guys even heard of it? It was done by uh, David Sarita. 
Uh, no, but I definitely know who he is. Yeah, it was really long. A lot of not a lot of not a lot of people kind of sit through the whole thing, but in it he. How does long are we talking have, about here? Like three hours, four hours? Three hours. But uh, long, it, yeah. it's yeah, it's, and it's kind of slow, you know. So uh, in it, and it's a little nebulous uh, about you know what the focus of the whole thing is. But he does these longer interviews with uh, Boyd Bushman, who kind of talks about how you know their black projects are probably what people were seeing as UFOs. He kind of alludes to Lazar, Bob Lazar in Area Fifty One, and says, "I gave you the Bob Lazar tape, so that should tell you something." And then finally. At the very end of the interview, he talks about how supposedly he had a friend who was a jet fighter pilot who shot down the Roswell UFO and then uh, went and walked in the UFO and saw the aliens. So he threw a little bone right out there on that. Of course, he talked about Bob Lazar's videos, but Bob Lazar had a lot of videos out by 2007. You know, he all of his stuff's posted on YouTube. So not right. that big of a deal there. Um, and I have big news concerning Bob Lazar too, actually. Oh, really? Yeah, this is interview good stuff. time. Interview yeah, we'll, time. We'll get we'll get to that in a second, but continue. Yeah. Continue. But uh, so now this new video comes out. They're calling it a deathbed confession, but it's not really a deathbed confession. But it is the latest interview with him, and it was done. Uh, it, they don't say when it was done, but before he died, which uh, was August seventh. So he only passed away recently. But in this one, he's way out there. He's talking about how he, he, he's talked to his team at Area 51, and his team um, you know, gave him some information. And actually, I kind of skipped the exclusive part that I had because in 2008, I was talking to a UFO researcher, and she said she was friends with Boyd Bushman, and she had a polygraph test that Boyd Bushman had taken where he admits to working at Area 51, having met aliens and handled alien material. He says he worked at S4, and he met Bob Lazar in this alleged polygraph test. So she forwarded the, me the email. So I told her, well, I would like to post it, but I'm going to ask you know, Boyd Bushman first. She said, go for it. I emailed Boyd Bushman because he was – it was she forwarded his email, so I had it there. And I said, you know, I'd love to interview you and uh, to talk about this polygraph test. And he, all he replied was with three letters uh, it's, or three or four letters. It essentially said, when and for how much compensation. And in fact, I think it just said, when and compensation, question mark. Oh, wow. Yeah, so I replied and I said, well, I was just going to, you know, hopefully <laughs> videotape this and put it on YouTube for free. But if you need money, you know, let me know what you need. Didn't hear anything back. I figured, well, at least hopefully he could verify the polygraph is real. He didn't respond right. to that email. I guess I, I – my only guess is maybe he was thinking I'd come back and say, well, of course, we want to pay you $15,000 or something. But uh, I didn't, so he dropped it. I don't, I don't know what the deal was. But anyway – I didn't hear anything back, nor did I post the polygraph because I didn't have permission. I right. sent it to a few researcher buddies, and uh, to their credit, they never posted it either. They kept it confidential like I asked them to, so um, that was really cool. But anyway, uh, now, yeah, this latest video where he says he wasn't at Area 51, so his story kind of changes this whole time. But there was a team that was. They sent him these pictures of these close-up UFOs, and the pictures right. are not that great. Nope. Uh, they, they say, okay, we also send you uh, – They this team gave him pictures of an alien, right. and we'll get to that in a sec. The team also says his friend was with an alien who died, and his friend sent him a picture of himself where there's an alien ghost in the picture. He oh sent a yeah. picture. <laughs> yeah. I'm and sorry. I, we posted I that. <laughs> he, he sent a picture that was supposed to be their planet, which is this little white dot kind of out of focus thing that is supposed to be their planet. A lot of crazy claims. So, pretty wild stuff. The photos. This is, rem are, this is reminding me a lot of uh, Billy Myers, by the way. Yeah, I hear you. I mean, the story changing and excuses for everything. Kind of mm. like this guy Dick French that we interviewed too, who kind right. of an older guy with lots of crazy claims, but his stories never panned out. It turns out these photos he was showing were actually debunked years ago because the person who received the and posted these photos first was John Hutchinson. 
the Canadian guy that he followed who did the anti-gravity work. John Hutchinson posted these pictures in 2008, said he received them anonymously from a supposed CIA informant, and uh, he, he felt that they might be real. Well, when those were posted, many, many people noticed that it, it's a doll, an alien doll from Kmart. So they responded with their pictures. Uh, now that this story has come out of Boyd Bushman and, and you know everybody is highlighting, of course, these alien pictures, uh, there's a lot of people coming out of the woodwork and taking pictures of their alien doll and posting it online. Yeah. <laughs> and if you see, you know, it really looks exactly like this doll. Identical. I've seen some you know pictures. Of like, yeah. You know, I, I've seen some pictures where people are like pointing out, well, look, the eyes on this one are squinted. Yeah. Like, he's, like, look how real this one looks. So this, this one has a little theory. bit more mascara than that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what people are out there saying, and, and and it's kind of frightening how many people believe this, and some of the listeners right now will probably say they believe it. So what the theory is a lot of these people have is that the government made the doll and had Kmart sell it so that if pictures of the alien ever got it out, they could say, no, it's not an alien. It's a Kmart doll. How's that? For now, us? if wow. you saw the Kmart doll moving yep. and there were yep. no puppet strings, then we'd have something to talk about. And it's then surprising. It's are, yeah. You're going to get this response to your show. There, are, Every time I post a story or every single post of this story, I see there's somebody suggesting that idea, even way back when with uh, the John Hutchinson stuff. So – for, that's another problem. He said he got it from his team at Area 51, but he actually probably got him from John Hutchinson, who posted him years ago. Or so from Kmart directly. There's a lot of holes in the story. Yeah, probably, yeah. I'm so going with that one on this kids. one. <laughs> Here's the big Bob Lazar story. So yes. he, play, he claimed in the polygraph thing that he worked with Bob Lazar at S4. Bob Lazar is notorious for being very hard to get a hold of. The only person he really talks to in this field is George Knapp because he talks about he doesn't like being part of the UFO field. Well, uh, George Knapp is a good buddy of mine, mm -hmm. and uh, we've been talking to him and saying, you know, uh, in these last videos for the anniversary where Lazar did some interviews uh, that George Knapp posted, he, you know, he has an important message to get out there. And uh, we would love for him to come to the UFO Congress and tell that message. And George Knapp said, well, you know, if anybody's going to do it, I would trust you guys because we've got a long history with George. And so it's going to happen. Bob Lazar has agreed to come to the UFO Congress in 2015. Wow. George Knapp is going to do an hour or so about Lazar and uh, – I've seen him do this. That he did a similar thing at Mufon, the Mufon Symposium. If you're a skeptic to Bob Lazar's story, once you listen to George Knapp, you're going to be like, you're going to be scratching your head and mm -hmm. saying, yep. "Well, what the hell's going on here?" <laughs> so, and <laughs> yeah. then they're going to do a Q and A, and and they're going to sit down, and George is going to uh, pick some questions that we'll be gathering over the next few months, and and at the conference, and George will oh, ask. Oh, see, see, hang on, hang on, that's not fair. He's going to choose which questions to answer, not take and field answers directly from the audience? Yes. Yeah, that's not it's fair. That's not – no, no, no. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. He can't pick and choose. Do you on this show? You do? Yes, yes, we do. Of course we do. Absolutely. Many times you got to admit you regret it. Um, um, hasn't that really happened yet? No, not yet. No, we, we, we've, we've only had, had, had good callers. we once in a while. Yeah, we've Every had good callers time. for the most part. Which is good. Do you screen? Nope. Nope. On screen calls. Man. <laughs> nope. I don't know how you do this, but that's great. Every time I'm on coast to coast, <laughs> because we have intelligent, non-sarcastic listeners. Yeah, you that's do. Why. Yes. And, but even at our conference, I would say a quarter of the questions. And I, I'm sorry for the people who attend the conference. You're probably not the people I'm talking about anyway, because it's the same jokers who run to the microphone every time, and never do they want to ask a question. They want to make a statement. That often has nothing to do with what the speaker just talked about. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've you know, noticed that, yeah. For these reasons, it's really frustrating, and we really want to get to the root of things. However, I am good friends with George Knapp, and we've talked about this, and George does not shy away from the hard questions. George is a journalist, he understands that you can't do that to be legitimate because he's a journalist. If he's going to ask, 
questions in an interview, he's going to ask the hard questions. If right. you listen to him on Coast to Coast, he always goes for the hard questions. So he will be asking the hard ones. So that's a good thing that – you know, it's not just going to be that kind of this silly little Pollyanna. Yeah, it's not cookie cutter. He doesn't, yeah, he, he, what's your favorite color? Right. <laughs> so when you were on Area 51, what color was the the uh, phone yeah. you used? You know, he's an ask. That's one thing about yeah. George Knapp, and I've actually interacted with him a little bit in email and tried to get him on the show here. Uh, he really he's is a, a legit busy, dude when it comes guy. to that. That he is. Mm-hmm. That he is. He's an Always. awesome dude. He would do it if he had time, but... I mean, if you know what, your news reporters are busy 24-7. You never get really time off when you're a news mm-hmm. reporter. On top of that, he's doing coast-to-coast and stuff. He's a extremely busy person. I yeah, say no they kidding. have a screener at the event, just, you know, just not a screener, but an MC saying, Sir, you have a question. What's your question? Okay, let me repeat it for the audience. Yeah, well, you know, it just I'm, doesn't work. You can't screen at a conference. The only way you can screen is have people write down their question and, and bring it around because you can't waste people's time. Okay, ask your question. Well, sorry, we don't like your question. Can you go sit right. down? I mean, what like, are you afraid of at this point, honestly? Well, but it's not being afraid of something. It's getting good questions. You're yeah. just afraid someone's you know, going to go on a rant for no gonna, apparent reason. Well, it happens all the time. If you go That's watch, true. you know, if you go to these conferences like I do a lot of them, that's what happens. You get most of the questions, and then they're asking about their favorite thing. So in other words, they're going out there and saying, well, have you heard of Billy Meyer? He did something really interesting, and he talked about the prophecy of, of ISIS and blah, 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 blah. And, you know, we'll go on for a few minutes. What do you think of that? And, you know, often speakers in those cases have to say, uh, I don't know much about that, but thank you. Uh, or, Next you know, question. it's... It's off topic, and it's not. You know, I I know George Knapp. He'll get to the questions that everybody wants to know. Then I would everybody's honestly say that like George about Knapp the education thing. Everybody's going to want to know about some of these things that uh, are some of the harder questions. You I know. say George Knapp should actually acquire all the questions and put them in order, but don't let Lazar see him till he's actually on the stage. I oh, want to no. hear Lazar's not going to see them. Oh, okay. We're sure of that. Uh, well, that's not what what Knapp and I have discussed. We've talked about not having that be the case. But uh, – and Knapp says, you know, there's not a problem because uh, Lazar is willing to talk about whatever and uh, that, uh, you know, like I said, he wants to – it's kind of a once and for all clearing the air on some of these tougher questions. Okay. Interesting. This is going to be awesome. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I, I can't wait to see uh, the video on it. Since oh, I- my goodness. I'm, I'm saving money now since to try to be, be there. You can't be there. Why not, Seth? We were going to say because <laughs> you can't be there. Oh, uh, it's, when, it's when November what? It's February. February. Um, what day in February? Because I actually. To the 21st. Funny as it is, I actually have my calendar on my computer. Yeah, good. Uh, I am going I'm to tell you. I'm marking it down and hang I, on. I'm saving money now. I am. Because February, uh, February what? 18th to the 21st. Mm-hmm. Okay, here's what I got. I have the Miami International Bro- Boat Show and Yacht and Brokerage Show. Well, it is early enough where you've got plenty of time to reschedule. There you go. I can re- I, it's hard to reschedule um, 220,000 people going to a 27th annual boat show. Is this well, something you, you're running? You can work around it. I, I have more than one exhibitor space there. Oh, son of a uh, – hire some little cutie yeah, there that you, go. you can um, – that will be so appreciative she'll want to go on a date with you later that can run it for you. There you go. I, I would love to hire She's Booth Bagel. She's going to pocket half of the money, but, you know. I, I, exactly. I would love to hire Booth Bait to work that show. My problem is, is just that show alone, I'm probably going to do just me and one other person working the booth. We're probably going to do about sixty to seventy thousand dollars. Okay, oh, and that's man. that's a hard thing for me to turn down. Okay, uh, I got to break in right now because we actually got to hit commercial break. And oh, for uh, Alejandro, <laughs> I want you to stick around. Can you stick around for the rest of the hour here? We, you know, sure. we have uh, Let's do uh, it. Uh, 
we have a guest coming up uh, now on the other side of the break. Uh, Dan Martin is going to be with us, and uh, we're going to promote something really cool. Dan Martin is promoting uh, a Kickstarter account, and it's uh, for free food factories, for organic free food factories. Uh, this is really, really cool and neat, so I want everybody to please pay attention uh, to what he's going to bring on, on here for the next 20 minutes. Uh, this is uh, something that I think uh, could definitely benefit a lot of the listeners. So stick around. We're going to go to commercial break here on Skywatchers Radio. We'll be right back with Dan Martin on the other side of the break. Open lines if you guys want to call in, if you have any questions for Alejandro, myself, or for Alan over here, or for Dan. Do I'll, so let, I'll let Alejandro try and convince me uh, to get to the convention yeah, while on break, and hopefully we'll have a real answer after the break, folks. <laughs> Keep you in suspense. Welcome back to Skywatchers Radio Live again on the Dark Matter Radio Network and PSN Radio. With us on this second segment of the first hour, we have none other than a good friend, Dan Martin, who's been on the show with us before to talk about the apocalypse. Well, now he's on to a different project and a really, really cool project. Uh, Dan, welcome to the show, and uh, tell the folks about this uh, free organic food factory that you're working on. All right, Jackal. Thanks for having me, first off. Um, as we went over before, uh, let me just run over just quickly for the listeners that don't remember or haven't heard. Um, a little bit brief background about myself. Uh, I was an engineer for Boeing Aerospace. My wife was an engineer for AT&T, both very lucrative careers, uh, sick, ro- sick of corporate America, consumerism, capitalism, um, cashed in all our investments, sold two waterfront homes in two different countries, cars, jet skis, boats. Uh, burned the cell phones, TVs, computers, and left society. Uh, six years, we lived 100% off the grid, self-sufficient. Um, we didn't leave our homestead once. Uh, we didn't see or communicate with even one other person the entire time. Uh, no news, no TV. We made our own uh, home, our own food. We grew our own food. Uh, made our own solar panels and wind turbines, gray water systems, rake right? catchment systems, so on and so forth. So what we got going on now is... Um, well, let me just kind of run you through a little uh, example, a little daydream here. Um, imagine this. Imagine you walk into a restaurant for a nice, relaxing meal. You sit down at the table, grab your menus, and in nice, bright, bright red letters, the, the letters F-R-E-E appear next to each succulent dish. That's my uh, favorite word in the dictionary, by the way. Succulent? If it's free, dish. it's for me. No. No, free, free. <laughs> Secondly, that's my second favorite word. You know what the greatest nation in the world is, folks, right? Freedom Nation? No, donation. Oh, well, that's it. Uh-huh. Continue. So, uh, just just free. Every meal, every every dish is free. Um, no, uh, no catches, no hidden fees, no de- donations, uh, no cash registers. Um Okay, here's another example. You walk into a local organic grocery store, um, and guess what? All the produce, all the seafood is completely free. You fill your cart with a little bit of this, some of that. Your total adds up to zero dollars and zero cents. And again, well, you know, no as a big right guy, uh, as a big guy, I must say this is uh, something like Nirvana to me. Well, I like where and this I, is going. And I get, you know, I, I, how, how could you possibly do this? You have expenses. You have um, profit market. Right. How is this possible? Right. And, and that's it goes back to exactly what we did. We had a large, uh, after cashing everything, we had a large startup um, bankroll to um, purchase everything we needed to become 100% self sufficient. Like I said, we produced our own electricity. We had uh, natural and passive heating and air conditioning. Um, we lived in a non-habitable free trade zone. We didn't pay taxes. Don't work, so there's no income taxes. Um, we built everything ourselves, so there's no construction fees, no insurance, um, no expenses, no cell phones. We made our own fuel, no cost of gas, um, no mortgage. Once you eliminate all the expenses, uh, you know, there's no need to make any profit. You follow right. me? I follow you. Now, I if we can you. do this on a larger scale... Don't know uh, if I could do this, but I follow you. Go ahead. Which we are doing. Um, we're doing it right now, actually, um, feeding a small community of about 2,000 people in a little town, a little village called San Pancho, outside of Puerto Vallarta. And we're, we're growing all of our own food with aquaponics, hydroponics. And we're seeing about two times the production rate, two times the um, 
size of produce, two times the nutrient and sugar content, and roughly about four times the quantity due to an indoor year-round growing cycle. And that's with, that, with 99% less effort, 99% less cost, 99% less water, and almost 99% less loss when we compare to current annual industrial food production yield rates um, in the same zone. And then we don't hang, have a hard hang on, hang on. I got to ask a question. Sure. You're telling me indoor, it's 99 percent more efficient than outdoor using the natural sun's rays uh, with the cost with of LEDs. electricity. LEDs do consume power because that's actually something I'm more than familiar with. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we're, we we get all of our power 100 percent free. You get all your power 100 percent free. Solar power and wind turbines 100 percent free. Can generate enough power to provide enough LED lights for and and move the water pumps. Um, okay, we're producing about six tons of produce and seafood a month. I understand to feed it, but about the amount- two thousand people. Okay, so my question then would be the the enormous amount of money you need to construct the facility to house the lighting, the pumps, and the plants in would right. be your exorbitant cost. We're looking at about a hundred thousand um, in startup costs, and we have for the how land square, how many square foot of a, real, a facility. Uh, we're looking at building a. Let's see, I'll tell you right here. Sorry, 60, I, I'm a number foot, country. Oh, sixty thousand square foot uh, facility for a hundred thousand dollars. Yep, that's with seven hundred hydroponic bays, three four hundred thousand gallon fish farms. And uh, 100 hydroponic fed fruit and nut trees. For $100,000? For $100,000. You're talking about just a factory, just a shell, just a warehouse. We don't have all the, uh, you know, amenities of of sheetrock and plugs and nice lighting and flooring. No, no, no. no. I'm I'm just just thinking about the cost of the frame for a 60,000 square foot facility, just the metal enclosure. Just just the steel? Just the steel and the labor for welding and construction is about thirty thousand dollars for sixty thousand square feet. Wow! Yes. The land. I, I, was, who are you robbing? I, how are you getting someone to commit to that price? <laughs> that that just, just sounds current, amazingly, amazingly. It does, doesn't it? Cost that's effect. Current. That's the current rate of steel right now per pound. Okay, so that. Okay, that so you're factoring that in as the cost of steel right now. Not even press are being formed into the sheets that need to be used to manufacture. Oh no, no, the cost of steel is sold by the pound. It's already whatever form you buy it in I beam, C perlins, um, right. C channel. It's 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 just per pound. It's not you don't pay extra for uh, you know the shape you want it in. Okay, I I I I'm just still dropping my jaw at. Sixty thousand square feet for for that price with everything enclosed inside it already. That's just wow. Um, what do you mean everything enclosed inside it? Well, you're saying the whole entire facility is costing you a hundred thousand dollars. The structure loan is sixty thousand. The um, what we're going to have to pay to have the hydroponics set up, the base set up, is about another. Um, 20, but we are pretty much moving our whole facility from Puerto Vallarta up. So we're just going to pick transportation costs on that. The land was donated. Uh-huh. We have all the stock ready to go, all the plants, all the trees, all the um, produce. Okay, so you, have exi- so you have the existing raw materials to make this all come together. But So the actual startup cost is not $100,000. No, it's only going to be 62 or 67. I don't want to uh, Plus, see but, that, but you're not counting in all the assets that are coming along with you to put it together. True. You mean what it's going to be worth? No, no, no. Well, you're bringing plants. There's a value to that. Uh, the LEDs that you're installing, there's a value to that. Uh, even right. if it's something that was purchased prior, it still right. goes into the cost of putting this thing together. You can't tell me this whole facility is costing just $100,000. The Don't structure forget. loan is costing 67 That's it. We right, have the land donated to us. We have an angel investor out of Houston that's going to pay for all the pumps and lighting. Oh, and oh, see, I have, see. Oh, okay. Now, now I'm seeing the bigger picture here. I'm just talking about structure loan. Well, the only the crowdfunding is only for the structure loan. 
and ah, okay. um, what we need to pay for uh, permits for construction and um, the labor. All right, so, but everything else is coming along with. There's, right. you know, I have, there's, I have there's other out lot. external investments, in other words. That's already paid for. The, the Kickstarter right. campaign um, is... Tell us about the Kickstarter, because we're almost yeah, short on yeah. time here. So let's yeah, talk so about the Kickstarter. I'm, I'm sorry I went on a stretch on this. No, no, I'm no, just no. trying to understand. You know, well, you know if I'm going to put some dollars from the from the contributors, so I'm glad you're covering it. And, well, I'm you know, trying so to be one... I might be one of the contributors. I'm in a generous mood today. You know, we... We really don't need car. contributors as much as we just need getting the word out there. Oh, okay. um, contributors can come later. We just need to get the word out there. We need to get, it, get everybody looking at this as much as possible. The uh, place to go to is www.freefoodfactory.com. It'll take you straight to the Kickstarter. And we already have, we're already over $1,000 in the first three mm-hmm. days with almost 50 backers. And, um, Still got 50 days to go. You got, yeah, you got a lot, a lot to go. You have 50 days. Right. Says, says we haven't there. even started yet. So um, all the information is there. A great, great, great video that they put together um, explains everything that I just kind of crash coursed in. And um, some, some footage of our existing site. We have hydroponically grown papaya trees that are two months old that are already producing fruit. And, uh, I mean, you're talking two years on any other kind of tree uh, before it even starts to produce fruit. Uh, and, and that's how we get these these massive quantities of reproduction and and, and sounds the, exciting and half the time with you know because the tree doesn't have to grow these huge root systems to look for water it doesn't have right. to grow these huge root systems to protect itself from the from the wind and cold and you know it it develops all of its time in a straight producing fruit and uh, you give it optimal conditions optimal lighting optimal temperatures optimal food and um, and it's going to just straight grow fruit really quick and uh, really big and really fast. No chemicals, no um, no pesticides, no no GMO. It's completely ha- healthy, organic food. The only the only food that it's eating, the plants are eating, is the waste from the fish. And then that water is recycled, reoxygenated, and um, brought back to the fish clean. So it's a closed loop permaculture system. And um, we're ready to go. It's our. It's not a theory. It's not a dream. It's already in work. It's been in work for eight years now, and uh, we're just upscaling. That's it. Very cool. And again, how they could, tell everybody again how they could find the uh, Kickstarter page. Uh, freefoodfactory.com, or go to Facebook and find us at um, Facebook slash Free Food Factory. And we just need to get the word out. We're not asking for contributions. Again, if if you have to contribute, I'm not gonna. Stop you, but really, well, you, you, you kind of are by asking for pledges on Kickstarter, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, let me ask you: uh, Are you concerned with the Kickstarter uh, thing? Because Kickstarter, if you don't meet the pledge, uh, you know, goal, you don't get a, a, a single dollar. Have you thought about crowdfunding or uh, some of these other sites like Indiegogo or any of these other websites like Kickstarter? Uh, we we looked at the other ones. They looked at the other ones, but um, they decided on Kickstarter just because it has a higher. Uh, Success rate. It's a little bit over fifty percent of the pledge of the the projects that go in get funded. So we went with them. If we don't, cool. we'll just try another method. And uh, if it doesn't come to the United States, it won't come to the states. We got another place going up in um, I want to say Africa or Egypt. Um, the, uh, they they need investor, food in yeah. They need food in Africa. Oh man. The, the angel investor that's out of Houston is from Africa or Egypt. I don't remember which one offhand. But one of the conditions that he's donating the pumps and materials is if we can duplicate it for him in uh, Africa or Egypt. So that's the next site. We'd like to do Detroit, where um, all these factories and warehouses are already abandoned and trying to give yes, away. Then we don't idea. even need the back the sixty-seven thousand. You know, we just recycle a whole building. You know, repurpose yeah. the building. That's an excellent idea, actually. That's a great idea. It's not a bad idea. Put, I was actually no, in yeah. Detroit recently. Um, and, and you there, put the people back uh, back to work in Detroit too, because you'll hire from within. Absolutely, but how do you pay them if you're giving the food away for free? All of our staff is volunteers. 100%. Oh well, in other words, no money going back to Detroit. That might pose Detroit. problems in Detroit. Just food. <laughs> Just food. <laughs> Dan, I uh, hope this uh, meets the goal, man. I hope uh, wish you well on this. this is, it sounds interesting. Uh, again, this is something I think we all uh, would could benefit from, and I love free food, so I'm with you. 
No, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you for coming on the show. And uh, again, everybody, check out the uh, the Kickstarter account and make sure you you pledge. Even a dollar helps, right, Dan? All right. Oh, the thing is, even a, if you just pledge a dollar and make sure you comment, it boosts us up in the visibility yep. of the search engines. Just the one dollar pledge. It does. It doesn't matter the the quantity or the quality. Sorry, it's the quantity. The more pledges you have with the comments, the more visible the the campaign is. So yeah, just exactly. a dollar will help. Exactly. Dan, thanks for being on the show, buddy. Thanks a lot, partner. I appreciate it. Talk to you soon. That gentleman uh, right there is Dan Martin, everybody. Great guy. And uh, that's a great cause, man. It really is, guys. I think the... Uh, no, it uh, sounds the, interesting. The idea is really, really, really cool. So much luck to uh, Dan. Uh, everybody check that Kickstarter account out. Now, we do have a caller on the line who's been very patient with us. And uh, he wants to ask a question. So we're going to let him do that. Caller, 717 you're live on Skywatchers Radio. Now you can ask your question. <laughs> Thank you. My name's Lou. Good yes, he is. I have a question for. I have two questions in a sense for Alejandro. Um, the most specific one is: I read online that he accepted a challenge from Stan Friedman about the MJ12 documents and debating about them. I was curious if that's been arranged. If that's really going to come off. And the second question is, or really for all of you, is when are we going to hear Ray Fowler interviewed? So. I'll, I'll keep listening, but go ahead. I won't interrupt. Interesting question. Alejandro? Uh, the second one first, Ray Fowler, because I think that's great you bring him up because he's kind of an unsung hero in all of this. I mean, he did a lot of the greatest cases and some of the best books. In fact, the Allagash abductions is a, one that he did, and we're going to have these guys at our conference uh, that were part of this. And this case is as good as Travis Walton. One of the great things mm -hmm. about Walton is he's so credible himself. You meet him and he's a regular down-to-earth guy. These guys are just like that. So uh, I agree with you. He is right now, the last thing I read about him, he's doing some um, some classes, like free university type classes on UFOs and on life after death, or at least uh, our near-death experiences, which I guess is another passion of his. But nobody I know of has been able to get a hold of him. And uh, it's, it, from what I understand, he's not really wanting to engage in the UFO field and, and stuff like that. He's more interested in his uh, uh, his uh, death, uh, that, uh, his other topics. So, yeah, I agree with you. I've been trying to get a hold of him, and I think he'd be great to talk to but uh, um, if you can get a hold of him or convince him, you know, I think either of us would, would love to have him on. He's great. Okay. I'll probably, um, I'll probably take time to make an effort. So I'm rock. Indeed. Uh, yeah, I'm glad you asked. And you're right. You, you have listeners that do ask good questions. But, uh, See, we, we have great listeners on Skywatchers Radio. Surprise. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it is surprising. No, just kidding. Best network um, ever. Stan Friedman. We've been going back on email and everything, and it's really frustrating to me because one of the things he hates – now, and I should preface this with the, that me and Stanton are really good friends, and, and we mm -hmm. – uh, even though we debate, I think more so than with other people he debates, we get along very well. Um, but one of the things that frustrates me is he gets really upset when people don't read his stuff and then want to debate him on it. And that's frustrating me right now because he – and this is my problem, and it's really been one of my problems with his whole study of MJ-12, is he completely ignores how those files came to the public eye and the whole – disinformation right. scandal that took place. He keeps trying to argue with me that there was no disinformation scandal. There certainly was. I am not using verbiage here that is um, you know, overblowing, overstating the whole what happened. These people, one of them being an Air Force employee, um, did say he he was part. It was you know he was engaged in conducting a disinformation uh, program. Then this UFO researcher who, after and this is an important part, after Stanton did all of his research, the majority of his research, I should say, into MJ12, he got a grant for like sixteen thousand dollars to research it. After he did this research and. Uh, that's when he found out that his research partner was working with the government disinformation guy. This is a big deal, and Stanton wow. has to, to talk about this. Mm -hmm. I've gotten to him to answer a few questions. Actually, Paul Kimball, who's his cousin, 
uh, interviewed uh, nephew. on this stuff. Nephew. Or, you're right. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Nephew interviewed, did a great interview. He just recently posted on this stuff because Stanton admitted to me in private that Bill Moore is a liar and a cheat and he didn't trust him no. and uh, all no. of these things that happened during this period of time. This is what Stanton told me. Um, he was, for instance, taking money and not sending stuff to people and this is why Stanton broke off relations with him. Um oh. But, uh, yeah, and it's in the interview with Paul Kimball, so you'll have to check that out. Because my point is we need to talk about this stuff. This is my research. Just because it's casting doubt on the veracity of the documents, um, that's a totally different subject. You can argue with Kevin Randall and everything over that. I'm just saying this happened, and how can you try to say that it's not important to the documents, and how can you say – by no, then there's no way it's part of disinfo- uh, uh, this disinformation scandal when the whole term MJ-12 came from Doty, this guy who was working for the Air Force. So I want him to focus on my research. I mean, that's fair. That's what he asked for. And I want to ask him questions about this because he needs to address it. He doesn't want to do that, so we're kind of at an impasse. Uh, um, so it'll probably happen down the road. He's been really busy. Uh, we've been conversing uh, online over email, mostly back and forth, although some of these things uh, he has also sent to Frank Warren uh, with UFO Chronicles, who has also posted some of our comments back and forth. So we'll see what happens. But like Kevin Randall says, you know, the, the they've done hundreds of debates, and what does it really get you? Everybody sticks to their own points. Uh, everybody sticks to their own sides. Nobody gets convinced of anything. And really, for me, I'm a journalist. I'm my point and what my goal is to get out facts and information, right. not to necessarily my to me. My opinion is totally a side subject and almost moot. I mean, I would rather have people take the facts and information and make up their own mind than care about my opinion. It's great that people do care about my opinion. I'm willing to share it. But I always tell people that's only my opinion. I respect everybody's right to an opinion. You know, form your own opinion. And uh, we always try to be very unbiased when we write our stories um, at openminds.tv. Um, I, I, I can't certainly stand in for Stanton with information, but I assume he would, one point he would make is that the, the Menzel appearing in the list of MJ-12 people is probably way beyond Doty's uh, pay grade. Well, that's not and, true whatsoever. Okay. And in fact, here's the okay. other problem with that is okay. it's not beyond <laughs> – this is what I would argue, and I know I, mm-hmm. I, I kind of tease Doty, but it it's true. It's not beyond Doty's pay grade, but perhaps beyond his mental capacity. And the well, only reason yeah. I say that – is when you read the documents that Doty hoaxed, and he's very open oh, yes. about having hoaxed, yeah. which included MJ-12, which was the beginning of all of this, they're very poorly written. They're really yes. silly and yes. bombastic. However, the documents later that many suspect were the ones William Moore helped with are much more sophisticated. And this yeah, was the period so. of time when William Moore was working with him. And it's certainly not beyond William Moore. I mean... Mendel was the biggest debunker at the time. So he's a perfect type of person to put on a list like that because then you could say, oh, you know, just like every debunker these days, everybody says every debunker is a disinformation. How many times do you hear that, you know, like uh, Seth Shostak is really a disinformationist or SETI? Uh, We've got a story about that today on our our, our website, SETI being disinformationist. Um, Hmm. So everybody makes that argument. So that would be perfect if you wrote a document today to say, oh, Seth uh, Shostak is actually now part of MJ-12. And, you know, he's just trying to dissuade people and make them look somewhere else when he knows what's really going on. So I don't think that that's that really big of a deal personally otherwise the one of the damning things has always been that stan friedman writes this in in his book even that him and william moore already when he saw the list he knew that it had to be right except for menzel because him and moore had already come up with that list oh, had they? Moore, had they? Except for menzel this, or whatever? exactly and i asked him okay. is that true he said of course it's true because me and moore we researched and we made a list of people who were probably involved with the uh, whole UFO thing. And when that came out in the MJ-12 documents, I thought, hey, what a, you know, we were right. 
Bingo. Well, yeah. that's awfully coincidental. And Kevin Randall makes the point that after all of this time, we know more about the major players. We know who were the aides, who were the majors and stuff that were involved mm-hmm. with some of this stuff. And why hasn't it come out that any of them were involved or why were were they unaware of this whole thing when in reality they would have been? And it's just because they didn't have the information back then. So um, – and and really when it comes down to it, what have we learned from the whole thing except for chase our tails uh, with Dodie's <laughs> lies? Um, what have we gotten from this? No government document talks about MJ-12. We haven't been able to uh, talk to There's one. Remember? People. Remember the one onion skin document? There's, that, there's uh, a twining memo. That, the other one that, that you know. Stanton, coincidentally, only believes three out of the dozens mm-hmm. is real. Right. But the rest are fake. Right. But that is one he believes is real. If you read how Moore says he got that document, it's really silly, this whole cloak and dagger thing. And I've written about it several times. I have this video on it too. But um, at Open Mindset TV, you can find a video on YouTube, the MJ-12 disinformation scandal. But um, the other problem with that is that it was Moore and Chandera, Moore who was yes, part of the dis- that found it. And right. coincidentally... Right. Stanton couldn't be there that weekend to go with them to go look for this document. And the, they even say the document was not in a place it should be because it, it had nothing to do with the documents, the other documents in that okay. area. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other problem is that even if it is real, all it does is say a meeting about MJ-12. It doesn't give any reference as to what MJ-12 right. was. Um, right. So if Doty was sanctioned to do this disinformation by the government, if Doty – and that's really the, the – There's a lot of ifs here. Yeah, yeah, but if Doty was sanctioned to do this by the government, which is what many UFO researchers, the UFO researchers who know the details about all of this that happened, that's what the vast majority of them believe. And if that's the case, of course they're going to fool us all. There's, I don't think there's any way we'd be able to t- tell truth from reality if they actively tried to trick us all. Um, the, it would be very easy for them to do, and they would have a lot of resources to do it. That would mean Doty was working with probably a team of people to create all of this stuff. Um, Agreed. It, so it, it, we just can't discount that possibility. Agreed. Agree, no, Guys, I have to cut you off, though. We have to hit commercial. We have to hit commercial yeah. break because uh, we have um, a very, very, very important guest waiting in the wings. Uh, Dr. Michael Heiser is waiting for us uh, to get him on the show. Uh, Lou, I'm sorry. Uh, you're going to have to ask the question next time, my friend. We've taken way too much time. We're over on the break here. Guys, we're going to be right back with our main event guest, Mr. Doc- or Dr. Michael Heiser. Again, I've been, this is a show I've been waiting for for a long time. This is years in the making. I'm so excited to have him on. So please stick around. We're going to be right back with... Dr. Heiser on Skywatchers Radio, right here on the Dark Matter Radio Network. All right, everybody, welcome back to Skywatchers Radio, back from break, and with our main event guest, that's right, the one, the only, a gentleman who has uh, been on my mind for years to have on this show or any other show I've been on, because I, I'm a huge follower of what he's uh, of what he's been able to do for the last uh, decade plus. Dr. Michael Heiser is finally on the air with us. Welcome to Skywatchers Radio, sir. Welcome. Thanks. Thank for Thanks here. for having me. I know it's a, it's a crazy uh, amount of people on the line right now, and uh, a lot of people are listening in. Uh, a lot of folks, uh, you know, find you controversial because of of your background. First time I heard of you was on Art Bell's show, mm-hmm. calling out the famous Zachariah Sitchin, which uh, I talked about earlier on the show. And uh, of course, it's very controversial to say anything about Zachariah Sitchin. Uh, people really <laughs> uh, hold on to his beliefs like his uh, religion. Uh, but what you did years ago completely inspired me and turned me around. On the whole Planet X, uh, you know, theory and the Anunnaki and Sitchin's work, uh, that was awe-inspiring to find out that you know it was all a big hoax and a lie. And the way you did it was just masterful. Can you tell the audience a little bit about how you started going in on Sitchin and how you know you got interested in talking about what he was working on? Yeah, the it's kind of a weird you know story because what I the way I sort of got drawn into all this officially, I mean, I'd always been interested in UFOs and paranormal stuff and things like that. You know, again, sort of a peripheral kind of lurker. And when I 
essentially dumped my dissertation for a year, the first year of what should have been my PhD dissertation, and, and wrote a novel called The Facade. Well, that, you know, long story short, I eventually got on Coast to Coast because of that novel. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and I was familiar with Coast because I'd listened to it while I was in grad school the whole time. And, and there, there's nothing in the novel specifically about Sitchin. But when I, when I got on that show and some other shows, this, it kept coming up all the time. And so I thought, well, I, I need to know who this guy is. I mean, I knew who Von Daniken was and things like that. But so I, I looked for him. And at first I thought, wow, you know, a kindred spirit. You know, he's talking about ancient languages and all this sort of stuff. And then when I got into his work, it's like, Holy cow, you know, this, it, I mean, this is a bad Surprise. freshman paper, you know. It, just, it was Red it was, flags everywhere, wasn't it? Oh, just, it, it was one of those things where I don't even know where to start uh, because I could just see problems everywhere. And so what I did, again, it might have been a little naive, but I created a website. And I didn't really know exactly what I was doing, but, I, you know, it was the, the Internet was, was young and stupid people like me who thought we could actually put up a decent site did so and, you know, either succeeded or failed in whatever area. So I put up this site called SitchinIsWrong.com, which still mm-hmm. exists. And I, yes. I went through basically the, the, the core items of his, you know, his mythology. And again, since, I mean, I like to say it this way, I am what Sitchin claimed to be. I mean, this this is my field. I mean, I, you know, when you go to grad school, you got to take all these languages, you know, right. Semitic stuff, and and so I could evaluate very narrowly in, in, at that point uh, what his language claims were and and sort of you know things like that. And and the site has developed over the years. I mean, if you go up there now, uh, you'll you'll see really exciting things like me going to the electronic you know, text corpus of Sumerian literature online. I made a screen capture video. You can watch me with the mouse and I find the site and I type in, you know, Anunnaki and I hit the button and you get all of the occurrences of the term Anunnaki in the cuneiform tablets. And then you hit the little TR for translate. In other words, you can check up on me Right. It's bo- it's boring video. There's no special effects. There's no CGI. None. In None fact, at you all. made a, you made a comment <laughs> in one of your videos that uh, this is another stuff you do if you want to get girls. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and it, you know, you know, I was fortunately I was married. You know, before I yes. was doing stuff. Like that. <laughs> but I, I mean, I, w- I would do stuff like that to basically show. Look, I, I don't want this. You know, to be like it's Mike versus. I want you to just know where the data exist. And then go look. I mean, the, the the stuff's out there on the web. I mean, I, you know, I, I canned you know searches through the Hebrew Bible and put the PDFs up there. I'm anybody who's followed me for any amount of time knows that I'm big on directing people to primary sources. That right. usually kills the conversation. Yes. Uh, you know, it, it, and and that's why I do it because I, I I want when a claim is made about a primary source, well, it would make sense to go look mm-hmm. at the primary source to see, you know, if, if this is up to snuff or not. But, you know, your, your listeners, should, if, if I'm new to them, I mean, I'm not, I'm not Philip Kloss here. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I want, you know, to believe in extraterrestrials. I think it would be just neat, you know, the next best thing to slice bread, that kind of thing. I'm a I'm a biblical scholar. I don't I'm mm-hmm. not offended in any way by the idea of extraterrestrial life. It doesn't up, upset any theological apple carts for me. I mean, I it, it's just it's fascinating stuff. And so I separate the serious stuff. Mm-hmm. What I what I think of as serious ufology a, away from this rather cartoonish Goofiness. You know, ancient aliens, yeah. wackiness stuff. You know, to, yeah, to me, which, they're, they're, different, they're different realms. Which Can we'll I get to that in a second about? there. Go ahead, Alan, and I'll Yeah, good question. Um, Michael, uh, or doctor, whichever you want me to call you tonight. Doctor. Mike is fine. I used well, to tell students they, had, they could call me Mike or your holiness, and it was usually <laughs> Mike. <laughs> so. well, what's your opinion on the Pope just recently announcing that – he believes the Big Bang Theory is actually accurate and true. I think it's yesterday's news. I mean, that, that, and I mean, like, not, well, not yesterday's news, like a century ago's news. You know, it, mm-hmm. it, within both Catholicism and Protestantism, there's, there's very wide acceptance 
of uh, Big Bang theory, evolutionary theory. The the issue, the theological issue for for people, whether they're Christians or you know conservative Jews or Muslims or, or whatever, is you know the the initial causation. In other words, we don't have a problem with evolution. We do have a problem if if it's totally naturalistic. You know, in other words, right. you leave God out of the out of the equation. When, no when divine I went, intervention is what you're is well. What, I, well, I'll give you an example. When I was at Wisconsin in graduate school, the church I went to there was was a, a campus church, and it was it was heavily dominated by people in the hard sciences. It was really rare to find a grad student or a professor in the humanities like me. I mean, we had the head of environmental studies uh, was in our church. We had the head of the botany department. We had two research physicists who worked in the super collider. We had an entomologist. We had a geologist. I mean, it was just so dominated by the hard science people. And all of them were serious Christians. And they all believed in, you know, they would either call it theistic evolution or evolutionary creationism or something like that. You know, where, where God was the initial cause of the Big Bang. And after that, it's like, well, duh. You know, it, it, they just had no problem with it at all. And so since I've been around a lot of those kind of people, it, it's kind of silly when I hear that, oh, you know, this evolution is just going to crush theism. I'm like, really? <laughs> I mean, you're, you're like, you're so underinformed if you're thinking about that. You're, you're, it's kind of the equivalent of the fundamentalist who's never been exposed to, to Christian scholarship in this area that, that doesn't take like a literal 24-hour day view. It's just underexposure. Now, this is this is uh, insane, by the way, and I mentioned this earlier. Uh, you know, I am an atheist, uh, but I, I tend to agree with just about everything that Michael is saying, uh, especially when it comes to the languages, uh, because, you know, we were talking about this earlier, uh, Mike, uh, you know, off air, and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's certain truths that, you know, escape whether you believe in God or not, and the the Hebrew language, the way that you talked about uh, the mistakes that Zechariah was making, uh, that right there is where the, the truth is, right? Yeah, I, when it, when it comes to Sitchin, I mean, not not everybody's in this bucket, but when, when it comes to what Sitchin is doing, there are a few items, and I would say that the minority uh, of the issues I have with Sitchin are about translation. The the core ideas, right. it, it it's worse than that. What what I'm actually saying on the website, and you know, some of these. You know, parts of the website I've talked about, like me searching for Anunnaki, is that his core ideas, such as the the Anunnaki are from Nibiru, like like Nibiru is their home port or home planet or whatever it is, and Nibiru is a is a planet beyond Pluto. And I mean, you will not find a single tablet that associates the Anunnaki and Nibiru. That's just one example. So it's not that we're we're quibbling about translation. I'm literally saying it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist, right. So, I mean, how easy would it be for someone to, to shoot off, you know, to me in an email, the, the tablet number, you know, the, the chapter and verse, so to speak, tablet number and line, well, here, 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 here's one that has, you know, Nibiru beyond Pluto, or here's one that mentions the Anunnaki with Nibiru. How easy would that be to basically just make Mike go away? Right. Um, if if it existed, and so I'm saying, look, the the core ideas just literally aren't there, and you know when you get beyond that, it's like he must, you know, he's making mistakes with Hebrew grammar. You know, languages, like you said, language is what it is. Now, and let me ask you: know, you, it, do you, Do you think this was a mistake, or do you think some of this was done on purpose? Because I, like when when we you know moving forward uh, out of Zechariah for a second, when I saw the uh, ancient aliens debunked video. Uh, they, they you took part in also uh, when, you know these guys were like flat out lying. Yeah, I, 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 you know, it's hard for me to look at Sitchin as being that bad, uh, that that flawed in terms of character. <laughs> well, you I know, gotta I, ask the question: How many of them? Do you, how, if as Angel was saying about watching ancient aliens debunk. How many of these people do you think were actually outright lying or just a little bit on the misinformed side or just not educated well enough on the, per yeah. the, the other perspectives of what they were looking at? I, I think there is some, some out-and-out fabrication. 
um, I mean, there's obviously a spectrum, but what what I think the real crime here is that we've got a cash cow here, and right. and we're just not going to look at mistakes we might be making. I mean, we we're not going to to do objective research in preparation for an episode just to make we're not going to fact check anything. We're going to just spout this idea and we're going to put some object that you know doesn't have any inscription and we're just going to call it this and we're going to say it originated over here mm-hmm. at this time. We're we're going to we're going to present this this picture of this object that actually exists and then we're going to take all these data points that you know sort of surround it or, or aren't even related and we're just going to stitch them together and and we're going to have an error. Now that that to me is deceptive. Um, so I think there is a, a, a character element in here, but, but with, with Sitchin, I think in some cases, um, he, he sort of latched on to an idea and just loved it, convinced himself of it. I don't think he studied any of these ancient languages. Uh, the, the, the mistakes are just too fundamental. And well, uh, he was the, Jewish. This, this so, is the point though, because so, he doesn't have any documentation ever that proved that he was a scholar of any of this stuff, right? I know. And I've, lo- I've looked around for it a lot and... I would think if it existed, somebody would have sent it to me and said, ha ha, you know. That, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, 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 it just, it's not there. Now, he, he was a journalist, and he was Jewish. Uh, he, I have to assume that he could read Hebrew. But here's the problem. I have four kids, okay? My, all of them can sight read English, okay? I don't know that many of them could do grammatical analysis of anything they read. Mm. That that's an entirely disciplined system. Explain the grammar to me. Talk about the semantics. Talk about the syntax. Talk about the verb tenses. You know, that that's the kind of stuff that when you're when you're in the field of ancient texts, this is what you have to do. Right. It's it, it's textual analysis. So that's a lot different than being able to read a language. And so, I think part of what Sitchin does is in that category. I mean, I assume he could read. I don't, I don't know that for a fact, but I assume he could. But when it comes to to making points of analysis, like when he says, Elohim is is a plural word, and it always you know refers to you know plural gods and stuff like that. Right. That is many just flat gods. out wrong. Right. No, he, you're you know, right. It is that flat out wrong. Uh, I went to a yeshiva for a large portion of my early years. So, yeah, he definitely got that one wrong. Mm-hmm. You know, I, and, and I, I don't know how to explain that. If you're a Hebrew speaker, you should know that even if you can't do grammatical analysis because it's your language and you have to have things like subject-verb agreement. And if you're Jewish, you're going to be exposed to the Hebrew Bible at some point. You know, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I just... I, I don't. I don't really know. You know, I since I can't psychologize him, and I and I, I tried to avoid doing that. I tried to stick to the the flaws in the work. I don't really know, but but my my gut tells me he's just he's not as bad as what we're seeing today. Even though people use his material, well, he inspired. Like yeah, but he inspired the people that are that are today. Him and uh, Eric Van Daniken. That that's true. That's true, and a lot of people have run with it, and I mm-hmm. think it's it's exponentially more the the cash cow. You what do you know, think is worse, though, in the long run, him or Van Daniken when it comes to making these things up? You know, I actually think Von Daniken is because Von Daniken included that, uh, I think, a fairly sinister uh, racist element uh, in, mm. in his ancient astronaut theory. And I, I don't see Sitchin doing that. I mean, there, there are places where Sitchin even tries to sort of talk positively about you know, the God of Israel and things like that. But right. Von Daniken, I mean, his, his personal history is very checkered. Uh, you know, he's got this, you know, boy, the, the Africans in Egypt, that was just a flawed genetic experiment. I mean, he, he says things like this, and I just don't, I don't see Sitchin doing that. Yeah, I agree. Sitchin, he was a little bit more cookie cutter. You know, one thing I, that I believe that really gave him a little bit more credibility with a lot of folks was when NASA entertained the idea of Planet X years ago, and he has a couple of interviews uh, that he actually went to NASA, and, and they spoke about the possibility of being an, a tenth planet out there. Uh, I think that lent a lot of credibility credibility to Sitchin. Yeah, and, and it's a classic example of correlation not being causation. Right, exactly. Well, don't forget also that a lot of... Uh, uh, the other thing that NASA pointed out was a lot of 
the uh, stars that we see out there are actually binary star systems. Right. And they've actually hypothesized that we are actually part of a binary system. The problem is, is that the ne- our can't find uh, it. Yeah. It's not that we can't find <laughs> it. It's, it's a brown dwarf, <laughs> which really isn't something that's easy to find. You know, so mm-hmm. with a brown dwarf and maybe one or two planets orbiting that because of the uh, gravity. It's uh-huh. it's it's an interesting, uh, you know, the, the the conversation here is interesting in that it shows where how Sitchin was able, you know, after a book or two, mm-hmm. was able to to sort of draw on ca- catastrophism, the old Velikovskian models, you know, for some of his things. So Sitchin is actually fairly eclectic as well. Um, in in what he's you know where where he's going you know where he eventually went I guess is the is the best way to say that as things other ideas accrued you know to his initial work but you know I I think you know he and, and it may have been his publisher I mean I I wasn't reading him in the in 1978 when Twelfth Planet came out but I, on his books you know I don't I know was, about the original. I was one years old I wasn't reading him either so don't. yeah <laughs> <laughs> you know his but it, you know it, the the books will make the claim that he's an ancient language scholar and stuff like that. Right. Well, I mean, you never saw that with von Daniken, and so it creates this this air of credibility, you know, to to what's being said. And you know, frankly, like like I said, this isn't stuff that you do to get girls. I mean, how how many people <laughs> go into this stuff? I mean, our these departments, you know, reality check here. My department at the UW was small. <laughs> okay. mm, yes. I mean, it, it's not like people are fighting to get in to do Hebrew and Semitic studies, you know. It, yeah, but you're going to get girls with the really the scary cat lady women. <laughs> <laughs> oh my! I'm let's sorry. Just that, not, let's just it, not go there. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, I, well, hold on one second, uh, Alejandro. You're still on, right? Alejandro, are you still there? Or? He might be. He might mute himself. He's probably. He might have muted himself. Yeah. Okay. I oh, didn't mute myself. I am here. Okay, for all of us here who have been to UFO conferences and other conventions, would we all agree? Uh, and I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to stereotype or anything, folks. Oh, really, of course. But, of course but tell, not. tell me, how many of the women that you do see there come off like that scary cat lady? At the UFO Congress, the women are beautiful. <laughs> they are gorgeous. That's you know what they say on the answer. internet. You know what the, you know the famous quote on the internet: "Picks or it didn't happen." <laughs> Show me That's picks true. or it didn't. That's true. I, I do believe their believe. chicks are into chicks are into UFOs. All right, all right. There's a lot of cat ladies there. <laughs> I, 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 I've, I've, I've seen some strange things. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> you know, but it's, like, it's, it's, on, a, it it's a distinct minority. Questions. It's a distinct minority. We are a distinct minority. Well, I know, but it's a minority well, within a minority. You know? I'm Cuban, so I'm definitely a minority. Now, uh, I don't Mike Burke is for that, but Cuban, yeah, no, distinct it's a minority, minority within a minority. <laughs> a minority within a minority. Yeah. There should be a word for that. Nerd, I don't know. Micro minority. <laughs> There, you're micro minority. There, I like that. Uh, now, speaking of uh, of uh, minorities or people in general has you know did you go and get attacked by anybody after you started coming at uh Zechariah Sitchin like did you find uh some of his big supporters or fans did they come at you at all uh, at some of these lectures i mean did you find uh, that there was any negative uh blowback from you coming out and and uh, pretty much tearing his entire theory apart well i i've i've only had what i would call one what i would call negative i've only had one negative experience and that was I'm not going to name the conference because I don't want to, you know, stigmatize it. But every no conference is a good conference. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> correct. Another, another, another excellent answer. Um, but I did go to a conference, and the the person I think, well, I don't, I don't think they. It was obvious they didn't vet me, and so I gave them the titles when they asked me to speak. You know what I'm going to speak on, and one of them was was Sitchin's material. And I went in there and basically just dismantled, you know. It, it, but but the people in the room were okay. <laughs> I mean, they, I could tell they were disturbed, but they were okay. But the the people who organized the conference uh, refused to 
uh, remunerate me as we had agreed <laughs> and and basically told me I would never be back again. <laughs> so, I, I will tell you, uh, Michael, it is like finding out that Santa Claus is not real. When, I mean, when I saw your work, I was like, my God, I've been lied to yet again. First Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny, now <laughs> Zachariah Sitchin. I cannot believe this is happening to me again. It, it is kind of like that. Phoenix. I can imagine the people sitting there, the faces must have been like deers caught in headlights, huh? Well, it, yeah, there there was there was definitely some of that, and there was a small sort of pro peanut gallery there, <laughs> uh, in the way way back, close to the exit. <laughs> True or false? Uh, did you were you wearing a bulletproof vest that night? True or false? No, I, I was not. I was not. Again, just a little naive, but I mean, you did, you, you go to I, I like UFO you? conferences. No, no, that and, and, you know, that's terrible. Well, you know, I. I Given the context, I understood, and I wasn't, I mean, I wasn't going to complain about it, but, you know, it was what it was. But I have never had, you know, anything like that, you know, happen since. I mean, I, I don't, I don't do a lot of conferences. I mean, I tend to, I tend to, to go where I'm invited. And now this, this year I'm going to go to the IUFO uh, conference, or next year, I should say, in February. But and I'm not speaking there. I'm just going to go as, you know, a, a, an attendee. But, you know, usually if I go, it's because somebody's asked me to do something. I actually like UFO conferences. I, I tell, uh, you know, because I get the question on both sides. I, re- I refer to myself as the equal opportunity offender. Uh, I, I get it from, I get <laughs> I like it from the religious, you know, crowd too, you know, the, mm-hmm. the, the Christian crowd. Like, what in the world are you doing? You know, why do you go to, all, go to these events? Why do you do this goofy stuff? And, you know, it, both from academics and, and you know, the, the normal people. And... I, I tell them, look, I love to go to UFO conferences because people there, you can have a, a better discussion about spiritual things there than you can in church in most cases. True. Is because this where those, I say amen? Yeah, you can say <laughs> amen, yes. But the, this, and I say because they, they're used to thinking about big picture questions. Right. And they enjoy that. Who are we? How do we get here? What's my destiny? Do I have a purpose? You know, all these major, I mean, they're all inherently theological but well, spiritual and they're, they're and prime are two different things yeah i mean they, they are yeah especially structurally um but they are primed you know to get into these conversations and and i i like going to them you know it, it doesn't certainly doesn't trouble me but i actually enjoy it you know you're the perfect person to ask this question uh you know what are your feelings on uh, this report and actually i teased about this earlier in the show and i really wanted to, uh, to touch base on it or talk, talk about it so i'm Glad I remembered, but what are your feelings on Professor Brian Cox saying that alien life is all but impossible and humanity is unique? Yeah, the rare earth, you know, hypothesis. I mean, there. Right. I, I would. I think to be fair, we have to say that there, there is, there are data that, again, if you're just looking at those data, that would suggest that. But I don't think it, it's fair to say that that data has won the day. Um, mm. I think it's, that's definitely premature. I, I would look at a statement like that and think of it the way I think of the Drake equation, right. which to me is, is pretty much useless. I know it has this sanctified status now, but I mean, I, I'm, I'm of the, I agree with Michael Crichton here, the late Michael Crichton, who basically said that the Drake equation is useless because you, here you have an equation where someone who someone invented the the components to the equation and assigned values to each component that are not the result of empirical analysis. In other words, it's a guess. Right. It's made up. It's a theory. You know, it's a theory. You know, and, right. and so to to look at the Drake equation and say, oh, this proves something to me is sort of the other side of of looking at the data that suggests you know a, a really slim likelihood. Uh, you know, of life elsewhere, at least as far as we can measure it or where we're measuring it. I, I think that's premature. No, I agree. No, but wouldn't you agree also, uh, Michael, that just about almost every scientific uh, breakthrough has been really just theories that have gone over? Like even Einstein's theory of relativity, it's a theory. You know, we're, we're pretty close to understanding the entire thing, but it, everything is theorized in science uh, first. Uh, so why couldn't this be a theory that could be proven? Alien, you know, life out there could be proven, even if it's microbial life. The thing is, it, would it would there be intelligent life? 
Uh, that's yeah. the, the really the question, the intelligent life that knows uh, how to think, how to reason, how to build ships, how to fly through space. Mm-hmm. That is the grand question. Uh, I think there is life teeming all over the cosmos, but intelligent life, that's the question, really. It It, it is, and that's really what, what everybody's angling for. But I think, and this, this, this might disturb people in the audience, or they might totally agree. I mean, who knows? But like in my novels, you know, I get, I get to explore a lot of these sorts mm-hmm. of things, and, and there's a conspiratorial bent there. And in that material, I, I basically suggest fairly loudly in some places that it wouldn't matter. Because as soon as as soon as one microbe is discovered, people are already predisposed to connect that dot to a whole host of other ones. Right. And so if if you were either if you were somebody sinister within the military industrial complex or some intelligent evil that's not human or you know whatever spiritual view, I mean if if you're any of the bad guys, you know whatever gaps, whatever buckets they're in. You could very easily manipulate people with just a, just one little data point like that, and and, and you could create you could create a herd, you, and you could direct that herd, you know, to whatever other decisions, whatever other things you want them to think. So it, it I think that shows that what everybody's really after, they want this the intelligent life thing answered, mm-hmm. and and they're so they're so ready for it, and you know I, I'm I want to I want this to to be valid too i mean again in my lifetime i have a small list of things that boy i'd like to to know if this is this or that and this is on that list it really is one of the one of the most important questions that that mankind could possibly answer or are we alone yeah so Uh, so i are we alone but are they intelligent like us i mean that's a heck of a question yeah and and so i'm 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 there wanting proof Mm. for this and and that that's that's also the danger because the more you want it and the more you really assign Sort of like you use the term, you know, kind of religious qualities to it. The the human propensity is to evaluate the claims less, right? You know, because of the of the direction that that you want it to go, and I th- I think that's that's a danger. It's also why, in today's you know conservative Christian world, the question of ET life is sort of viewed negatively, whereas you know. A, even just a couple centuries ago, it was actually viewed very positively. And that's because in today's world, the discussion can't happen without marrying it to, and I don't think this is necessary at all, but it happens, without marrying it to naturalistic evolution. Hmm. We found this microbe, therefore aliens exist, and they got here just like we did. There is no God and all this kind of stuff. Well, none of, those are all non sequiturs, right. but, but, but they're, they're going to be the way that either certain people think or something is presented. And so people who are, you know, religious and have a reasonably high view of, of the Bible get troubled by that. And, and that bothers me because I don't see any of those things as necessarily connected. Now, would you say that there's any indication at all in any of the religious uh, works, Bible or the Torah or anything that could indicate uh, any alien intervention whatsoever? Well, I, I uh, in, intervention. I, I don't see that, but but alien or presence. at least interaction or, or presence, right? Pre- presence or existence. Mm-hmm. You know, existence is is the the big umbrella one here. Um, yeah, there there are actually places that. But let's say that. I mean, I'm I'm not the guy. There's teaching. a stack of Old Testament references. Yeah. Well, I I my go to place would actually be New Testament. There are there are a couple places in Hebrews, you know, the book of Hebrews in chapter eleven. There's one, there's one in Hebrews chapter one that talks about, um, you know, God making, you know, the world and things like that. If you actually look in the Greek text, that the, the term translated world in those verse references is actually plural. Now, grammatically mm-hmm. and semantically, there there's a way to uh, look at that and 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 not conclude that more than one is meant. Uh, it's just a, it's, it's a language issue. But you can certainly look at that and say that more than one is meant. I mean, you, you can get that from those passages. And so if if tomorrow, you know, E.T. lands on the White House lawn and say, hey, we, we aren't alone and all that sort of thing, it's like, it, it's very easy theologically to say, well, I guess, I guess the, the plural form of the, the word there 
was meant to tell us, meant to inform us, even though we didn't, our minds didn't go there initially, was meant to tell us that, yeah, there are other worlds. Right. You know, I mean, that, that's easy to do. But, again, I'm not, inv- I'm not, this isn't any profundity on my part. I mean, this, this material was discussed back in the 19th century, you know, by people of, you know, whether they were Catholic or Protestant. And, and, of course, you know, you have your, your peripheral groups, you have your Gnostics and your Theosophists. They're all interacting with ancient texts. And they're talking about passages like that in a positive way uh, with respect to other worlds. That was common. Uh, very, I mean, if if you had a Christian audience, I could give you names like Timothy Dwight, who was the president of Yale, very famous mm-hmm. uh, Protestant, you know, theologian. Uh, Chalmers, very famous Presbyterian preacher. I mean, they they talk publicly about there being other worlds and that this was a good thing, and of course there are, and blah 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 blah. I mean, you just don't see that today because we're on the other side of of not only Darwin, but we're on the other side of people who use Darwin as a wedge against faith. Again, and, and again, none of these things right. are necessarily connected, but they are, they are used and, and abused in certain contexts and certain discussions. And it, and it has really soured the, the disposition of a lot of you know, Jews and Christians uh, against the whole idea. Muslims, I think, have a little less of a problem with it. There you, there you could argue for intervention, yeah. by the way, in the, in the Quran. I mean, you could argue f- that uh, th- you don't have as much leeway for extraterrestrial intervention in the course of human life and history. Uh, you, you do have it, again, there's a little bit, little bit of, a, of a crack, you know, door crack open there in the Quran, not so much in in the Christian Bible or the or, you know the Hebrew Bible for Jews, but still what, what the you, idea. What do you make the of the Nephilim, the though? Oh, the Nephilim again. There, I don't know. To this day, I don't know where Sitchin got his people of the fiery <laughs> rockets thing. I mean, that, that is just that's just nutty. I mean, let, let he me was reading plug. the subtitles. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know what he was. He wasn't doing any Hebrew work, I can tell you that. Absolutely um, not. The Nephilim are in, in Genesis 6 are cast as, again, in a literal, in, in, let's put it this way, in one of two possible literal readings, cast as the offspring of the sons of God, which is a phrase that is used elsewhere in the Hebrew Bible for divine beings. And so you have this right. yeah, but you know, divine human it, cohabitation. Son, sons of God, but it's not the same analogy as angels. So is this another offshoot or another species? See, so yeah, you're, you're correct in that because you, you'll, you'll never see the word, you'll never see ma'ach, you know, <laughs> angel, mm-hmm. in the same passage or tied to the, the other phrase, sons of God. Exactly. Don't, you, you, don't, you don't have a textual overlap there. My own view is that you, uh, your base term, Elohim, uh, is not contrary to what most Judeo-Christian thinkers and preachers would, are want to, to believe, really a position they've inherited historically. It's not about uh, a unique set of attributes. I mean, we as English speakers, we say the word, you know, we, we pronounce G-O-D, God, and we think of a specific set of attributes because that's what we're taught. And right. there's only one of those because if there, was, if there wasn't, you know, only one, then you can't have a unique set of attributes. Well, the problem is, is that the biblical writers use Elohim of five different things other than the God of Israel. And so it can't refer by definition, it can't refer to a specific set of attributes. What, what, what Elohim really is, is it, it denotes sort of your, it's, it's realm distinction. It, it denotes the, your place of address, the realm you belong to. In other words, if you're an Elohim, you are by definition not human, not part of the natural terrestrial world. You're in the, quote, spiritual realm. Hmm. You're a, a disembodied spiritual being, which is why Elohim can be used of like the disembodied dead in 1 Samuel 28. 13. You know, they had their own logic for it that we don't have. Well, that's the base term. You're one of those guys. You know, you, you live over there. You're from that realm. Now, and is there a possibility? Son, sons, it, sons, of God is, sons of God is a hierarchical term. For that's how a good job. Sorry. Done. Sorry, Michael. That's a good job. But it could, it, real quickly on the Elohim, uh, could that have not been a, a mistranslation of what aliens could be and maybe they just thought they were? 
Well, if if you were an ancient person, you know, you, you would have you, no you, reference what an alien is. Right. You, you'd have no frame of reference, and so you you could conclude that. But what right. I what I would expect of the ancient people writing the texts would be some indication that you know these. <sighs> There's only one Elohim that is uncreated in, in Hebrew thinking and biblical thinking. <coughs> Pardon me. And that is, you know, the God of Israel. The other Elohim, mm-hmm. by definition, are created beings. They're made of something. Because you can only have one uncreated being. Right. So w- what I would expect is I would expect a little more commentary on they came from XYZ place, you know, maybe a specific star, or they came in a craft. You know, it's one of the oddest things in ancient material, the Bible, for example. You never have these beings sort of coming, you know, in in craft and leaving. And, you know, they they never, they, they don't require this. They just sort of show up. Right. You know, and so that, that's that's something that if if we were dealing with a biological entity, that I would expect to see and don't. So mm, on the one hand, well, none, none of they have transporters like on Star Trek. You know, <laughs> right? Beam me down, Scotty. You know, Beam you don't need down. to see the ship. On on the one hand, I think yeah, you know, an ancient person would have would have thought that way, but I I, I would think they would have said more about. I mean, they talk a lot about their god and other gods and all this stuff all the time and so do other ancient texts i think we just get a a, sort of a a better picture or at least the the picture that we're prone to expect with the need to travel and all this other all these other properties of a biological entity you don't you don't really get that you don't really get oh they need the 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 gods need to perpetuate their species they need hydration they need nutrition i mean they can do certain physical things but you never get like this you never get the idea again, and maybe it's just our modern mind that we, if we're dealing with a biological entity, there are a set of things that must be true according to science as we know it. Um, you know, so there, there's a bit of a, a science, scientific and a pre-scientific disconnect there. But you know, the, the the picture that I again, I would think an ancient person is capable of expressing those things, um, and you, and you just you just don't get that, which is again sort of odd. It's it's a disconnect. It really is. Uh, Lou is still hanging on with us. I know Lou had a very important question he wanted to uh, ask you. Uh, Lou, you're on, still with us. Uh, ask uh, Dr. Heiser here your question. Oh, <clears throat> thank you. Um, first, I just want to say to, I guess, you, Gackle, and Alan, and Eugene, you, you have to get this guy on for more than just one hour. Oh, no and kidding. I don't think two hours, two hours does not justice. Well, <laughs> uh, the, the, the quick question is... Um, could, could uh, Dr. Heiser take some of the money that uh, Angel is paying him tonight? And <laughs> ask... No, that's the only way I can get a quality guest like Dr. Heiser. Really, I, I unloaded the Brinks trucks in front of this man's house, and thank you for being here. <laughs> um, could he take some of that money and have uh, his? It's all monopoly his, money, by the way. But go ahead. Ms. Chasky, run an analysis of uh, Moore's handwriting or writing style. As mm-hmm. I, we were discussing in the previous hour with Alejandro, and um, to see if Moore actually did compose the you know, the most uh, significant MJ12 documents, and and I'm, I'll just want to mention that years ago I heard Dr. Heiser talk about Brad Sparks and Barry Greenwood's report in the 2007 MUFON, and I know that that's underlying Alejandro's work. Um, so I just wanted to thank him for letting me know about that years ago. Uh, so that was my primary question, um, and if not, if Assuming you can't afford to do it quickly, who do you suspect actually did write them, if there is one or just a few people? So thank you for your time. Well, I, I, mean, I am, the, the, the last question is a little shorter. I mean, I, I am dependent on, you know, the work of people like Alejandro uh, and others who, again, have, have uh, followed the breadcrumb trail back to a few characters that, again, have confessed to certain things and therefore look, look, like really good candidates, <laughs> uh, you know, for some of this other. Uh, I don't. I don't know if your listeners know a, a little bit about the history of what I what I had done with the majestic documents, but <clears throat> I I knew of someone. Uh, her name is Carol Chasky. She's a a, a PhD uh, forensic linguist, uh, and and her her doctoral project was writing a computer program to uh, test 
something that she would refer to and others would refer, refer to in the field of computational linguistics as authorship attribution. And that is if you have uh, a document or you actually need more than one, but you know, it depends what, depends what you want to do. But if you have documents that are authored by a known person, uh, her software program that she wrote, and she does this for a living. She's one of the like she's an expert witness in all sorts of court cases, and did so and so author this document or did they not, and things like that. So she has a long track record of having her work validated in in court. Uh, the idea being that if you take the known and you put it, you know, into into her software program, it will it will look for patterns. It will detect patterns and not in vocabulary, not in the words, the verbs and the nouns and the, the things that you could fake if you wanted to fake a document. I'm going to talk about this particular thing. It's in things like the, your, your conjunctions, your prepositions, even your punctuation, if, if you wanted to go down that far, that you would have to spend most of your life analyzing someone's work to be able to fake that. So you, you take the knowns and you get these patterns and then you take documents that claim a particular authorship. In the case of the Majestic documents, there are certain documents that have an author uh, attached to them. And, and then you run that material, that text, and then you, you see if there are matches. Okay? So what I, what I asked her to do was, again, I, I, you know, a bunch of these, you know, I don't know, eight or nine different authors and you know, we had known uh, examples from you know Hill and Cotter or Truman or whoever it was, and then we ran them against the unknowns and and the majestic documents did very poorly um, in in the results of that test. Now, what I wanted to do is akin to what the the caller just asked after I, I gave this this report away for free, and I spoke in Roswell on it at, at one conference. The idea was, look, you know, Carol said, because I, I paid her, I don't know, it was like 1800 bucks, $2,000. I mean, it was basically everything I had at the time, but I figured, you know, somebody needs to do this. And, it, you know, and she deserves to get paid for her work. So she's, I said, well, how much would it cost to do a fuller set of tests and look for this and look for that? And she gave me a number, and it was like five grand. So I went on coast to coast and said, look, here's the research. If you want this done, you know, we, we set up a, a donation thing, you know, to, to raise money for this. Uh, I'm not kidding. I got $20. Wow. Wow. $20 that I returned, obviously. I'm not going to keep $20. <laughs> you That's know, insulting, I got, actually. Yeah. I got $20. Well, what it taught me was that people really don't, you know, I hate to say it, a lot of people just don't want the truth. Yeah, that's you know, true. It, it, it just hurts, you know. And so, mm -hmm. but I will, I will tell the, the, the questioner, the caller, Lou, that the idea to match against Moore or Doty or, or people like this, that isn't actually what part of what I asked her to do. That, that, so maybe I could go back to her uh, and say, are you still interested? I mean, it's been seven years you know, since we did this. I don't know if she's still interested or not. But that would be a really intriguing uh, thing to do. I mean, I, I could ask her if she's still interested in... We could try it again. I mean, now that was the day we didn't we didn't have Kickstarter. You know, might be a right, good thing right. to do with Kickstarter because you yeah. know I went give the money to Carol and let her go to town on things and you know it, it's an intriguing possibility. You know, I, I just want I, there were other things I wanted her to do because she could do two or three other layers of testing to really um, you know get very granular results on, on certain things. And that's what I was thinking of. I wasn't thinking of uh, a candidate. But your, your, your caller is, is, is right. You know, we've got some good candidates now. It might be worth investigating that and asking her. Well, this is, this is Dark Matter Radio as well, so there's a lot of hosts that could plump mm -hmm. for your, your uh, kickstart, including our bell when he comes back yeah. to it, the radio. And it's true. It, 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 is, yeah. it is a different world than it was seven years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, the internet, you know, ha is considerably larger and more sophisticated. And it's united you, and us all. My God, united <laughs> yeah. us all. It really has. Right. It, I mean, it, is, a, it is a global. It is a global uniter to the internet. In many ways, it is. Oh. You know, in many ways, it is. I would you encourage know, it, you to do that. It, uh, it's a good sometimes. idea. Yeah, it, it is a good idea. Well, that was my that was my fundamental question. So, thanks for your time. And again, I want to thank you for uh, all the information you 
they're putting out. I know free, I think I bought some documents from you years ago, but I certainly appreciate it. I'm familiar with your website. So, well, thanks. Ha- Thank you. Mm-hmm. Thanks, for, Good evening, thanks again. for calling in, Lou. Thanks for calling sure. in again, by the way. Talk to you. Bye. That's a great Lou. Great caller. Yeah. Uh, guys, we're almost out of time. Michael, we have to have you back on the show here. This has been so much fun. Uh, the hours just flown by. Like I said, we, you know, you're the type of guest that you want to have on for three, four hours. I know I, I wouldn't want to actually do that to you because you're a busy man. I know you're you're busy, busy schedule. But uh, we have to have you back on soon to continue this conversation because uh, it's just uh, been phenomenal having you on. Thank you so much for being on here. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. Yeah, it was great definitely having you in here. Now, let's give up the websites real quick again so anybody listening in, uh, they can go ahead and, and check out everything that, you know, that you've worked on, com. Uh, what sure. are the websites? Well, the, the main website to go to is DR, as in doctor, DRMSH. Those are my, my initials. So DRMSH.com. If you go to that page, you'll, be, you'll see links right up front to everything else I do. Uh, including Sitchin. Sitchin would be listed under my Paleo Babble link. Paleo Babble is a blog that I run about mm-hmm. weird things that people believe about the ancient world, and UFO religions. That's another blog. Naked Bible is for biblical study. So I do three blogs. Uh, I, I would suggest, though, that when they go up to drmsh.com, put in slash links and then dash number two. And there are all sorts of links that, that gather all kinds of ancient astronaut sort of things and MJ-12 uh, research links that I think people would find really, really useful. Very, very cool. Uh, once again, thank you so much for being on here. And guys, we're all out of time here on the Dark Matter Radio Network. Unfortunately, we have to sign off for the evening or the morning or whatever. Uh, we will be back next week with another great show. By the way, please check out that Kickstarter account from Dan Martin. Uh, the food, organic, uh, free food stuff, that's great, uh, great stuff there. So please check them out. And, yeah, Michael, definitely look into Kickstarter. Or one of yeah, I, I will. It's, it's a really good idea. It's just something that seven years ago I didn't consider, and it, it's, it's just a good idea. It's amazing how technology has uh, just given us all these outlets. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. to you know do these things uh, but uh, it's, it's great great work um, Dr. Heiser keep up the great work my friend keep up what you're doing and uh, we definitely want to have you back on here guys we're signing off for the evening this is Skywatchers Radio thank you for listening We're going to have none other than Mr. Michael Heiser on the show. Should I wait, let me rephrase that? Dr. Michael Heiser. He didn't go to, to school for a long time to be just called Mr. He's a doctor. Dr. Michael Heiser. And look, people who've listened to Art Bell over the years should not be uh, a stranger to this man at all. Fascinating uh, person. I've been a fan of what he's uh, done for many, many uh, well, a couple of years now, at least two or three years, maybe four or five, maybe six, a lot longer, because guess what? He was on with Art Bell many years ago. I and, claim uh, him as the master debunker. Let's put it this way. Uh, this man turned me into a Zachariah Sitchin hater completely. <laughs> and, I used to be, and I used to be like the biggest fanboy for Zachariah Sitchin, Planet X, you know, all that stuff. I loved his work, and then I saw Michael Heiser completely take him apart, and I was like, I, I was done. Just, yeah, just completely. I'm surprised you're brave enough to say that because people don't like to hear bad stuff about Sitchin. But it's, I... a, it's true. It's true. It's you know, in the, especially in the ufology community, he's very, very highly regarded, and people love his work. And uh, like Eric Van Daniken and the ancient alien stuff. Look, uh, I believe that we've been visited, Alejandro. I believe mm-hmm. aliens have come down. I believe uh, that there is alien life out there. And there's a story we're going to get to in a little bit, but with. Uh, Brian Cox, a scientist who completely is dumbfounding me with a statement. And then there's a clarification on this statement that Alejandro is going to talk about also. But uh, before we get into that, you know, it dumbfounds me whenever I hear anybody say that there is no existence of life out there. No, I believe that there's life out there. Uh, But, you know, I also believe that people lie. Mm -hmm. And I love what Michael Heiser has done, uh, what Chris White did with his uh, video, uh, Ancient Aliens Debunked, completely just put it out there. You know, look... 
whether you believe this stuff or not, go and do your own homework. That's what I did. I, I saw the videos and I went and I started doing a little of my own research. And Michael Heiser was on point. I mean, on everything. Well, everything's true on the internet if you look hard enough. <laughs> that is true too. But see, I did my, I did a little bit of old school research. I didn't just look up Wikipedia. Sure, you did. I yeah, didn't just look up Wikipedia. Yeah, Wikipedia. That's what I did, probably. But guess what? We're also joined uh, with by Eugene, who's joining us on the uh, call here. And Eugene is sitting back, and I know he's uh, eager to talk to Michael Heiser. Also, isn't that right, Eugene? Oh, I cannot wait. I was screaming right then when I was muted, too, about the Planet X stuff. <laughs> to go back there, he's only been back there once in the night, and that was for a filming for a D- Discovery Channel thing, so it was with a lot of people. Um, so this will be really the second time. Well, it'll be with another group of people, but doing a sky watch. So, so he, he gets worried about being out there. He gets kind of freaked Do out. Do you blame him? Yeah, why, I know. Why put yourself out there, though, if, if you're going to be worried about it? I mean, it's kind of like inviting them to come back and take them. You well, know, I think know, it, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to say, all these TV shows, and everybody's probably begging him to take them yeah. out there. And so eventually, I think he broke down, and, and he's done it. And so it probably made him a little more uh, used to going out there. I think mm. we should have some real fun and actually have yep. him go out there Bigfoot hunting. Just yeah. cross-pollinate. That's it. Just cross-pollinate the whole entire event. Well, I know he's got – there's some guys in Arizona because he's kind of our little Arizona contingency He's because he's out here. I, luckily, I get to see him. We went camping a few weeks ago. Mm. Um, and uh, there is this group of goat, or Bigfoot hunters that kind of join us uh, sometimes in these excursions. So is that Bobo? They were Bobo? with us just a few weeks ago. I hope that's not Bobo. <laughs> it's not – I. Bobo. Um, Bobo it, from the show? Um, yeah, no, it's uh, these other guys. Uh, they, they, they're they specially specialized in the Mogollon Rim and the Mogollon Monster, they call the Bigfoot out in that area. But uh, to be honest, I forget what they call themselves. <laughs> All I could say is great googly moogly. Yeah. Um, Everybody, you know, in paranormal field, ev- all the groups have their own names and acronyms and stuff. And uh, Indubitably. Uh, yeah. Speaking of great guests, tonight, by the way, uh, before we continue with uh, the news here, Alejandro, we're going to have an amazing set of guests after uh, after this segment. Uh, we have Dan Martin who's going to join us at the end of this hour, and uh, we're going to talk about some stuff that he's promoting. Yeah, Dan Martin's a really cool author. He has a book uh, about how to survive the global apocalypse. You know, or Which any kind one? Of the, financial, the, glo- the financial one, the zombie one, the Ebola one, or the alien one? The one DC Comics is going through after Marvel announced their cinematic Phase 3. Oh, but anyway, good God, yes. You like that dig, huh? All right. Oh, yeah. We're going to talk to Dan uh, about some really cool stuff later, but in the second hour, and i got to mention this, Alejandro, because he actually said to tell you hi. So, and I know he's cool. listening. Hello. Greetings and salutations, fellow Sky Watchers from all corners of the globe, no matter where you're listening from. Welcome to Sky Watchers Radio. As always, I am one part of the dynamic duel, Angel, and with me as always is Alan. Say hi to the crowd, Alan. Hi, crowd! Now we're broadcasting live from New Logic Entertainment Studios, live on the Dark Matter Radio Network, and of course, PSN Radio. And we are joined from the very beginning of this show I want to just uh, have them have them on because we have a lot to talk about we're going to be joined with somebody who I've been getting bombarded with emails asking where he's been Mr. Alejandro Rojas from Open Minds Alejandro welcome to the show and thank you for joining us during the first hour here sir hello it is my absolute pleasure to be back my friend let me tell you something Never has this happened before on any of my radio programming that uh, a person cannot be on one week and I literally get bombarded with people asking me, what the heck did you do? Why wasn't he on? (laughs) Yep, yep. I was blamed for it. And something really cool was going on last week. I understand you were at some MUFON uh, stuff. Uh, There was a shooting, and I'm not talking about with guns. (laughs) Tell us what happened here with MUFON. What was this, uh, some kind of a training video exercise? What's going on? Oh, yeah, yeah, and this actually made a pretty big story. We haven't even posted our story on it. We posted kind of a smaller story, and it's gotten big. But, uh, yeah, MUFON last week did a boot camp for their for their field investigators, 
And it was a week long in the Arizona desert to go out there. Part of it was in the classroom. The other part was out in the desert doing some testing and stuff like that. So, yeah, we did. We go, went out there to film. We got some great interviews. Uh, but we were only able to do the classroom part because the other part was just a little too far away for us. And uh, But we got some pictures. And Roger Marsh, they sent Roger Marsh some pictures because apparently – they had created this silver kind of fake that looks like a giant colander, silver kind of chrome-plated colander upside down in the desert. Is that the, the thing that the guy uh, from Ghostbusters wears on his head? I don't – I'm not familiar with that colander what? thing, but uh, – don't, don't you remember that uh, Rick Moranis wears the colander around his head and he's like, are you the – Oh, geek? yeah, that's right. I remember oh. that part. That was pretty funny. But no, it is very different. This would have to be a very big person to wear this one. But I guess they had this thing out there. It was their fake uh-huh. UFO. And according to them, uh, this plane flew over and then some F-16 jet fighters flew over. They think checking it out. But uh, Luke Air Force Base isn't too far away. So they could have been some doing some training. And they may have checked it out because they thought it was a crashed uh, airplane or something. But uh, make for kind of a cute story that uh, – has gotten really big, but uh, we got some really cool interviews with these guys. Because, for instance, uh, you know, the guy's house it was at, Chuck Modlin, who is kind of in charge of the tech for MUFON, he's got this crazy background of working in defense and working on, on um, like, aircraft carriers and all of this cool stuff. But he gave us some really cool quotes about UFOs and investigating UFOs and the importance of the technology and everything. And, uh, Really cool stuff. So we're excited to post the video. We'll do that in a couple of weeks. We just got the pictures from the guys. But, uh, yeah, that's what we were up to uh, last Tuesday. Right. See, people, it was something important. Sounds fun. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. So that's what – yeah, you're right. It is something that's fun, I think, because uh, people wouldn't know about it. Uh, right. And so it was great that we were able to get out there and uh, – Tell people about it because we want to do that as much as possible is tell people about all this cool stuff that's going on in this field, you know? Yeah, no kidding. You know, we missed you last week, man. We had Travis on, and oh, my goodness. It was What a fun show that was, yeah. Yeah, he's awesome. I love having this dude on. I mean, he's uh, one of the the best guests to have on the show, and he's such a nice, nice uh, nice guy to talk to. Uh, Really missed you. He says hi, by the way. Yeah, we're really <laughs> excited because on the fifth of November we're going to go out there to film this, uh, yeah. this uh, you know, Skywatch at the place where that all took where place. Where it actually and, happened, yeah. Yeah, so if we get taken or if he gets taken, you know, um, <laughs> and you it's know, funny because it... I interviewed him and the last thing I said is we're going to be out there, so if you get taken, we're going to film it. And he had to <laughs> pause, like he was like, oh. He's like, I wouldn't like that. <laughs> he would not be a happy camper. You know, yeah. he, wouldn't be, he wouldn't be happy with round two. Yeah. You know, he, has he been back in the area much? Because I know he doesn't like going to that area much. He doesn't yeah, go there I, much. Huh? I wrote a story about it last week just specifically on right. that uh, aspect. And you're right. He doesn't go back there much. It took him a long time. To- I know you're I, a big, I'm not you're a big pa- Yo, but I, you're a Planet X uh, fan, aren't you? I, I am, but it's not so much as Sitchin. I mean, more Bob Fletcher lately has really gotten me back into it. I mean, I, I don't know if any of you have heard his uh, Late Night in the Midlands or Coast to Coast interviews in the past month or so, but I don't know. He completely turned me back around. Like I said, I'm not too much into Sitchin, but this, I, I don't, I'm waiting to see what Heiser says before I make up my mind. Completely. Well, I'll put it. I'll put it this way. This is one of the things that really got me interested in researching what Heiser was talking about years ago when he was on Art Bell and and when he literally publicly challenged Zechariah to debate him. And Zechariah knew about this challenge and he never, ever accepted it. Yeah, I mean, I I can't defend Sitchin. I mean, I'm a I'm not in any position to. But I mean, there's there's no points I can throw out to win the debate, especially with somebody like Heiser. So, I mean, as far as he goes, Heiser's going to win that debate every time. But as far as no the, what I take issue with with Heiser is, is he, he makes comments like that every UFO sighting can be boiled down to either technology we have or the breakaway civilizations that 
Dolan talks about what tech they have. So it's it's a little murky for me. Well, yeah, but we we just don't know. That's the whole point. We don't know yeah, what the I mean, answers are. Not knowing doesn't. It's mean- all speculation right now. Right, and even I think even Mister uh, or Doctor Heiser would agree that it's really all speculation. It's all theories because nothing can be really proven. Uh, but moving on, we're going to have him on in the second hour. He's the main event for the for tonight, and I'm so excited to have him on. I've been uh, this is literally a show a couple years in the making, guys, because I'm a big big fan of, of what he's done, and this is a rarity. By the way, now Alejandro, you're going to laugh. Uh, this is a rarity because, as you know, Dr. Heiser, he's a religious man. He's a b- biblical scholar. Uh, I'm an atheist. So, and this is a first, I think this is one of the first times on radio where you're going to have an atheist and a, a biblical scholar who agree almost 100% on something. Crazy, huh? Entertaining is more like it. Just a little Wild nutty. stuff. But moving on with uh, more news, Alejandro, uh, what's going on with Open Minds? I know there's uh, uh, Area 51 uh, deathbed confession. Uh, 